That's why when people, you know, when they talk about, you know, going to paradise is 77 virgins, I'm like, fuck that. 77 virgins. Like, do you know the admin around like, all of that? one milf and I'm sweet. Yeah, <laughs> I, one old cougar would just do me <laughs> no, 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 no problem. Hi everyone, I'm Jace Haskell and welcome to episode 15 of Couples Quarantine. Now today we have a very special... Don't I don't introduce guest. myself at all anymore, are we just going straight in? Yeah, people know you're here, you're you always here. Course. You're like a shadow. <laughs> this is my wife, Chloe, she's here all the time. No! <laughs> she's, okay, she's Chloe we'll made. Get, we'll get to this. Fine, she sees she's getting all fired up because of who we've got on. She's lying to make friends now, pretending that I'm under Iron Fist. But we've got writer, poet and broadcaster Salma Elwadani. Uh, who is on a mission to liberate women and lift men from their crippling mediocrity. Her work fo <laughs> <laughs> Not talking about me, obviously. Her work focuses on feminism, sex, pleasure, and change the narrative around Muslim women. Now, if that is not a powerful introduction, I don't know what is. <laughs> Sam, how are you, babe? Very good. How are you guys? Very well, actually. And you know what? I've been excited to get you on here for oh, quite a while because we had an interesting meeting. And before I let you sort of tell your kind of story, we met on a Jeremy Vine show, yeah. sort of the hub of middle class England. And I was, I was sort of, <laughs> I was in the, it was in the uh, room eating my free croissant and drinking my coffee, minding my own business. And I, was I, eating, and I grapes. Absolutely, yeah. eating grapes, yeah, yeah. And I said, who's who am I on with today? And they said, uh, Selma El Elwadani. And, and she, ardent Muslim feminist. And I was like, Great, great. I'm definitely going to get on with her. She's going to love me and everything I stand for. So this is going to be fine. And we sort of had an organised disagreement on on the show. Yeah. But actually, I, I felt like we we bonded and merged um, and where the friendship has blossomed. So do you want to tell everyone what you're about and uh, and what, you, what you're thinking about men at the moment? Do we have enough time to answer that question? The answer is no, <laughs> definitely not. Um, yes, I do remember our first meeting. And I do remember also thinking, I'm probably going to disagree with everything that comes out of your mouth, uh, which, was tr which was true. I probably did disagree with lots of things. But I always find that the place that you can bond with someone is taking the piss out of each other. And if you can have yeah. that, and if you have that banter. And as a northerner, I was like, we'll, we'll be fine. Totally fine. Um, what I'm all about, I, like you said, I think the intro was great. I'm a broadcaster, poet, writer. I'm also a business owner. I have a marketing business. I do a lot of public speaking around the world uh, on diversity and inclusion. But the thing that kind of puts all my work together and the, the theme that merges it all is, is feminism and, you know, women's rights and making life better for women and girls, which just also means you have to tell men about themselves because you can't talk about women's rights and you can't talk about feminism without talking about men and masculinity, right? Because these two things play off each other. So I spend a lot of time trying to tell men how shit they are on a daily basis. <laughs> Oddly enough- you're, related, you're not related to my wife, are you? Just out of interest, because <laughs> I, I get similar feedback a lot of the time as well. <laughs> Oddly enough, it doesn't go down that well online. Um, no. it would be not, not to the men. The men seem quite upset about it most of the time. Well, okay. so. I didn't know about you at all until I swear to God, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. James came home from the Jeremy Vine show, like ranting and raving about you and saying how you how fantastic you are. And I was like, oh, who is she? Tell me about her. He was like, well, she's an ardent feminist. I was like, stop, stop. <laughs> because I would say I've been with you for what, six years, right? And every single time. Six long years. <laughs> six long <laughs> ass years. Really quite long years. Hey, it feels like, like 60 years. You guys have got through lockdown one and that's when all the relationships broke. So oh, listen, oh, but strengthened. My best friend, is a we, I say this on every episode. People are like we fucking know. <laughs> my best friend is a is a sex therapist, a couples counselor, and she was like, I have never in my life had so many uh, requests on a daily basis for couples therapy. Then I, she said halfway through lockdown one, it hit, and she said, and even like to this day, since then, it ha she gets two, three requests a day from people. Yeah, so, so yeah, so he came home ranting, and raving about you, and saying that you were this feminist, and I was like. What the hell? So I obviously started following you and um, I absolutely love your content. And I too, uh, I like to think I'm more of a modern feminist. Growing up with my mother, I wouldn't categorize myself as the same kind of feminist as she categorizes herself as. <laughs> um, so I, I, and I absolutely love all your content and I love everything you do about women's rights. Um, and I, I basically just wanted to be the middleman between the audience and you and just say, please tell us about your background and tell us how the hell this all started and and how you ended up where you are now oh 
Jeez, that's a story. Um, <laughs> well, I think like most things, it, I ha- it goes back to my mother, right? So my mother is an incredible, if you think I'm an ardent feminist, my mother's like 10 times more. And yeah. I was also home educated, so I didn't go to school. So my education was very curated and it, I was very much given a feminist education. So when I was a kid, I was reading like Virginia Woolf. I was reading Mary Wollstonecraft. I was having like this very feminist upbringing and this uh, very female look at the world, which you don't get in the curriculum and you don't get in in your everyday like state school, right? Um, and because I was home educated, I'd go everywhere with my mum and I would travel with her around the country when she went for her work. And I, honest to God, I would grow up constantly with my mum just going, oh, fucking men. <laughs> or like, for anything, like if we'd gone into a reception and there was a guy being difficult on the desk, and my mum would be like, oh, it's a fucking man, and they're like, the patriarchy, <laughs> and it's bullshit, and they're always trying to oppress women. And as a, like, a young girl, I would be like, oh, he's just a bit much. Like, I think he's just doing his job. Like, cut him some slack. Yeah. And then I grew up and became a woman and realized that, oh my God, she was right about everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I honestly, I feel like I was probably a child soldier bred for war and like some militant <laughs> feminist war. Like I honestly, that's what I was, that's what I was raised to do. So it, it like, it, it just is completely natural that my work is about feminism and it is about female rights and it is about trying to make life better because I've seen it all and I've seen it since I was a kid and I've seen it through my mother's eyes and I've seen it through my eyes and like mm. the, the women around me. Um, so it just felt like it was the only thing that I could do and I had to do. I love that. You know what's so interesting? It completely resonates with me. What you said is that I'm so lucky that I grew up going to mixed schools. I've always had three older brothers. Mm. Um, I, my dad is like more of a feminist than I am. Um, and I'm so lucky. I never, I remember constantly growing up as a, as a child and then as a teenage girl thinking, I've never had any experience with sexism. I've never had any experiences with men feeling like they're entitled to any part of me, you know, mental or physical. Um, I I half wonder if it's not extinct. Obviously it did, it was a thing, <laughs> but I half wonder if it's not extinct. So then when I was, how old was I when I started my first business? 21? 21 started my first business with my now ex-boyfriend. And that was when it really hit home. I could not get a meeting. I could not get people to talk to me if I was in a meeting. Mm. Nobody fucking took me seriously for love nor money. And I couldn't figure it out. And a few weeks in, I had a meltdown of anger with my dad about it. And I told him all of this stuff. I said, they don't talk to me unless he's in the room. They don't address me when we're talking to them together. They don't take me seriously. They don't email me back. Like, what? how am I meant to run a business like this? And he was like, are they all men? I was like, yeah. He was like, they're sexist, Chloe. They don't respect you because you're younger than them, because you're blonde, because you're opinionated, and they don't know how to deal with you, so they deal with... My ex is called Danny. They deal with Danny instead of you. And ever since then, it has been a constant theme in my adult life that I have definitely had to push back against it to get fucking anywhere. Yeah, and you know what? It's really interesting that you say that because I think every woman has that point. So you have that point where you're a kid and you're, you hear about these things, but you're like, it's not going to happen to me or it doesn't happen to me. And then you kind of go into womanhood and then it hits you so hard in the face. There is no easing into it. You are suddenly aware of the harassment that you get on the street. The, the moment puberty hits, right? More people are yeah. beeping at you in the street, even before puberty, right? So yeah. it just hits you really hard. And I remember moving to London and starting in the workplace here and I was working in a recruitment. So I was working in marketing, but within the recruitment sector, anyone who knows recruitment in London knows what that, think Wolf of Wall Street and you're about right. Um, And it was just dominated by like white men from Essex most of the time. And just like this real laddish culture. And suddenly it was a problem that I was a brown woman. Suddenly it was a problem that I was a Muslim brown woman. And it just hit me so hard. And previously before that, right, things happen. You know, you experience sexual assault. You experience some of the most horrific things women go through. And then suddenly you're like, oh, oh, this is why it's such a problem, right? Right. Do you... You both paint quite a bleak picture. Has there been any progress on this? Or are we still firmly kind of in the dark ages in terms of uh, liberation of women and also the way men approach uh, women? I think we're in one of the most dangerous periods of female liberation that we've ever been in because now we have the language to talk about it and we have more awareness about it and we're having conversations that we've never had before, which is amazing, yes, but what you're doing now is you're paying lip service to the problem. 
and nothing is actually happening. And because everyone's talking about it, they feel like something's happening because they go, no, no, things are better for women now. But when you look at the legislation and when you look at the data and you look at the reports, you're like, actually, it's not. Like the current global statistic is that one in four women have been raped or sexually assaulted. That hasn't gone down. So don't tell me things are getting better when I know 20 women in my close circle who can all tell me their rape story, right? It's not getting better. We're just talking about it in ways that we haven't before. And it's basically what we're doing is we're admiring the problem. And then I think that gets us into such a dangerous space because then we go, yes, things are happening. And then we lure ourselves into this false sense of security that we don't have to fight as hard. But actually, we're just... Just, I don't know, we're just not getting anywhere. So, because obviously, the reason I wanted to get you on as well, because of, uh, of the fact of your, your your religion and your skin colour and because of, of what you speak about, I can imagine it's a very difficult thing. And I come from a completely different different world. Um, I am what is termed as an alpha male. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was... I, I like that you said life... that like it was a surprise to anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but sometimes, you know. Wait, wait. <laughs> Big guy news. Guy in the Big news. <laughs> Wait, this might shock a few people, but I am a bit of an alpha male. I mean, listen, I do have a beta side to me that occasionally allows to come out. Um, but the alpha male is always fighting, at the, you know, to get out. And but when you're around animals, that's your that's your female side. Yeah. Every other second of the day, you're the alpha male. This is true. And I and I went to boarding school my whole life, so I was around boys the whole time. Mm-hmm. So I went to. Um, in a boarding school, then I was in professional sports surrounded by men. So my only yeah. experience of women was when we were let out like in the zoo Page to have shows. a dance. You know, you'd have a dance for local school. And it was like, you know, we'd seen these, we'd seen girls, we didn't know how to interact with them. We didn't know how to talk. Yes, we, in my last two years at Wellington, we had we had girls, but they didn't look at me and I wasn't really looking at them because they didn't look at me. That was, um, the latter was a lie. Yeah, well, sorry, the latter was a lie, yeah. There was, well, there's, it's an incident in my autobiography, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and basically, Basically, yeah, I I didn't have that experience. So I was, my only experience with women was to sexualize them. They were only, I didn't have female friends. I didn't go to university. So I didn't have those interactions. So it's quite jarring when you come into the real world and you see other friendship groups like with Chloe um, and all her male friends Mm. and the normality of conversations and not judging women in in that way. So it's very hard for me to kind of comprehend, but there's a lot of what you say that really struck struck home with me, like some of the stuff you've done on your your Instagram about things like consent. And I know that because there's so much I want to talk to you about, so I'm, I'm hopping around. But the thing with the consent is is a really interesting one. That that still in 2020 there is men that don't understand that no means no, and that that you know that you, a woman has to consent to, to to sleep with them. I mean, you've got some strong opinions. This is this really such a problem? Yeah, it is. And because we don't talk about consent. We don't even know how to have a conversation about consent, right? Because, and this, I wrote something pretty recently on my Instagram about this, where I said, okay, to all the guys who've never grabbed a woman down a dark alley and raped her, sure, you've never done that, and you would never do that, right? We know the majority of men that we all know would absolutely never be rapists, okay? We can say that hand on our hearts. But they've also, I don't know, put their hand around a woman's neck when they're having sex because they've watched so much porn and they think choking is something that women just love and they don't have a conversation with her. Oh, by the way, do you like it? Right, exactly. Or they're like, you know, spanking women during sex really hard without having a conversation about it before, right? Or they've gone, you know, I've been in situations uh, where a guy's been like, oh, come on, come on, go on, go on. Like, Like, just have sex with me type of thing. And we'd had it once before, I don't want to do it again, right? Mm. But they don't, even that, right? Consent has to be acquired every time. Like once you have it one time, it's not then a free pass for all of the times, right? So I've been in those situations where guys have been like, oh, come on, go on, like go on. That's coercion, like mm-hmm. in any definition, right? And that guy who's, who, who lay there and was like, oh, go on, go on, go on. Yeah, he would never rape anyone. But he did try to pressure me to have sex. And he didn't pick up on any of my nonverbal cues. And every time I turned away, he'd like pull me back and he didn't get any of those cues. So sure, you're not a rapist, but you didn't get my consent. So what are you? Isn't this the statistic as well that the uh, a vast, majority, uh, vast majority of sexual assault and or rape happens in the home by somebody that the woman or child trusts? Yeah, exactly. By someone that they already know. I've got so many stories of friends. Like, you know, I have my own rape story and it wasn't by someone. It was like a stranger in the street, right? But so many of my friends' stories was by someone that they knew or that they trusted and they thought they were in a safe space. But then someone starts that oh, go on, go on, they push a boundary, they push a boundary. 
So when we're talking about consent, like James, growing up in that boarding school, how many times did you sit down and in class or with your boys and have a conversation about what does consent mean? Never. Right, you didn't have it. Well, and no well, one does it that... to women either. They, all, the, all that women are taught is you mustn't say no and you must, like, you must smile really prettily. So we're not even yeah. taught to say no. Do you know how hard it is as a woman to say no? Like I am yeah. possibly one of the most opinionated like women who tell men to fuck off on a regular basis and I still find it difficult to go no I don't want to do that that doesn't make me feel comfortable every time a male celebrity cheats on his wife there seems to be a general theme in the UK of well what did she do Mm. What did the wife do? Did Probably she, did giving she, it all that. Were they, <laughs> were they like this? Did we, she, maybe maybe she wasn't having sex while she was pregnant. She probably wasn't really that into sex for a period of time. Mm. And what's a man to do? You know, men need sex. And you're taught this thing, which is A, utterly fucking ridiculous, because it basically means that if a woman doesn't say yes consistently and put out consistently, then the man is entitled to go and find sex elsewhere. And the same thing applies to the consent thing. The, I think it's really interesting that a lot of the reason why rapes and sexual assault happen in the home with men that women trust is a feeling of entitlement to women. And you're completely right, babe. Like it does become increasingly hard and you realize it as you get older, whether somebody buys you a drink in a club, mm. Mm. on the presumption that that means you're going to go home and fuck yeah, them because they, yeah. they chose to buy you a drink. Right. It gets harder and harder and harder to say no. Of course it does. And everyone goes, oh, well, why don't you just say no? Like, as if that's the easiest thing. Because I've had my entire life's conditioning telling me to say yes to you as a woman. That's why. It's not so easy just to turn around and go, ah, no, not today. Because <laughs> uh, interesting, I mean, I... You know, when I was sort of single, you know, one of my greatest fears because of my size and everything else that was always being and, your career. and my career but it was always to be in a situation where you know, look, I I always enjoyed my singledom. I didn't mind promiscuous sex. I wanted to have sex with people, but I was always very much of the of the of the mindset that no meant no, and that if if I, for example, there'd be some occasions where. You know, someone would say, uh, I, I didn't used to live in London. They say, you can come back and stay at my house. Um, you can sleep in my bed, but we're not going to do anything. So I would be like, I'd be like, okay. So I'd go, get into bed, and I'd go to sleep. And and, and not do anything, because I don't, because that wasn't, they, they'd made it very clear. I, no meant no, and I wasn't I wasn't going to go along that path. And then I'd wake up in the morning, and the girl say, well, you know, you did, I, did, I thought you might try it on. I was like, no, no, because you said I, no. It, <laughs> You said no. You fucking said no. Like it, it shocks me because like, when I saw your post, that so many people think there is there is this entitlement. Um, there is no grey area. You know there is. Yeah, and I just I just find it bizarre because obviously there is a problem because they were doing those adverts. I mean I know Ricky Gervais took the piss out of them. You know with like the adverts like where you see the guy leaving the house and the mum's like oh you know what are you doing? So I'm just popping out. So like, don't go raping. And it's, it's like it's like what kind of society has to remind people not to fucking leave the house and rape someone? But but you're saying that there just needs to be much more education around this. Right, because we don't talk about the in-between bits. We talk about don't go raping anyone and everyone knows that's wrong, but we don't talk about consent and, and sex and how you approach sex, right? I am the biggest advocate of everyone going out and getting laid. Oh, 100%. <laughs> like, I am here cheering around for every... You should be having as much sex as you want and you don't need to be in relationships or to be married to have it. Like, get yours. And there is enough men out there who want it and there is enough women out there who want it that everyone can have it. There's, like, no need for there ever to be any questions of uncomfortable consent. Like, it just doesn't need to be there because there's enough people who willingly want to give it and want to have it, right? But that's why it annoys me so much when there is those grey areas, when they do exist, Right. Let me tell you a story that like really highlights a gray area for me. A few years ago, I started dating this guy, met him online dating. We go on a few dates. We get on. It's great. We have dinner. And then it comes to that point where, you know, we have dinner at his one night and you know what's going to happen, right? Mm. We both want it. We both attracted to each other. Great. Two consenting adults. So we get down to it and there's all the kissing and the touching and all the good bits that come before. And it gets to that point, And I said to him, you need to put a condom on. Like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The kissing continues. And then I go, you know, you need to get a condom. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Which, by the way, I fucking hate having to say. Like, why am I the one that has to say it? But that's interesting it on, that, you, right? that you actually say it because I, uh, again, and one of the, the, the fears I always had was, was STDs and 
at, you know, if you're going to go out and enjoy yourself, I all my mum drilled into me early on, no means no, and be safe, right? So I was, but I was like religious at it, and I'm shocked. James like, did this thing when we first started sleeping together with <laughs> me, like I would trick you into having a baby, and I know. <laughs> anyway. He had he would he would come in the condom and then he would tie it in like a double or triple knot and then like kind of weirdly just like shove it under everything at the bottom of the bin like just in case I was gonna so you don't get the turkey baster out yeah just in case she's not on (laughs) fucking on doing a headstand I mean you know this is some prime alpha male sperm you know what I'm saying do you know what do you know what though I genuinely like listen to that story and go feel so glad that at least one fucking man did that yeah but I don't but but, but my question to men is always. Why are you so fucking careless with your life? Right. Uh, yes, but honestly, I am like a genuinely. I'm not dobbing people in, but I my favorite Dob them conversation. In. Name names. No, 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 Here's no, no, the no. receipts. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my favourite conversation with lads is I'll go oh I banned so and so you're like okay yeah you talk any good you're like yeah, yeah. I said you bag up like no I'm like what are you doing? Literally. Like genuinely, what are you doing? The sheer number of people that aren't doing it. And I, but I love the fact that you say it. Yeah, so wait, so finish your story. Sorry, because nobody, because no girls would ever, never said it to right. me. I was always wanted to do it. And I hate saying it. And it's hard to say it because you feel awkward and you feel like you're fucking up the vibe and you feel like you're making it unsexy. But you're like, well, why haven't you just fucking said it? Like, why haven't you come with it? Like, and I remember like sleeping with one guy and without me even having to say anything, he pulled out a condom. And I was like, this is the best guy I've ever met. This and I is thought, one. is this the fucking bar? Is this like, <laughs> the bar is in hell. The fact that I'm like, this is a real, and I like messaged my girlfriends afterwards in all the group chats. And I was like, guys, he like pulled out a condom. And I didn't even have to say anything. And everyone's like, oh my God, what a great guy. What a great... <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, the bar is in hell. The bar the is so far. He didn't want to. He didn't want to catch an STD or put his child in me. Literally, and we're out here giving him a standing ovation. By the way, so Jesus, the bar is low. Yeah, so carry honestly, on with this condom. It's in yeah. the depths of Hades. So this story, right? So I've said it twice, and he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I say it again, and I'm like, he needs to put a condom on. Yeah, yeah. Three times I've told him to put a condom on. Like it's getting real close to that point where like you want to have sex, right? And then just in a blink of an eye, he quickly just slips inside me no 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 and then comes straight away right and what is obviously like comes to light later is that he has a problem with premature ejaculation right maybe that's why he didn't want to put the condom on i don't know but the minute he like literally and it you could have blinked and it would have been over and i'm lying there afterwards like shake like shaken right he's nigh in tears he's like i'm so sorry that's never happened before he's so apologetic and he's like, what can I do? Da, 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 da. Now, I now that now need to go and make sure that I'm like, do all the proper tests and all the proper procedures, take the proper medicine afterwards the next day so that I don't end up pregnant or anything like that. And mm-hmm. he's so apologetic. And if you were to, if you were to meet this guy, he's got loads of female friends. He's like, he's a great guy. He's what everyone would go. He's a good guy. He's never going to abuse anyone. He's never going to beat a woman. He's never going to rape someone. He's a good guy. But that good guy still stepped over a line. And I didn't, I told you three times to put a condom on and you didn't. And that's what happened. So tell me, where's the boundary with consent? What did you do with consent there? Because I didn't say yes. And you did it anyway, even though I said do something three times. Give me a name for that guy. He's not a rapist, but he didn't get my consent. And it's, it's beyond the parameters of disrespect when it's your body. When it becomes physical, I hate I hate to be, you know, dramatic about this, but when it becomes physical, it does straddle a line between disrespect and abuse. And that's that's the problem. Right. Um, and me and all my friends sit there and we talk, we talk, we spoke about it afterwards. And he's super apologetic. He's not misogynistic. He's never said anything misogynistic in his life. But I can't wrap my head around the fact that I essentially told you no and do something else three times and you still didn't fucking do it. Because in that moment, you cared about your pleasure so much that it overrode security, safety and what I was saying. And you. And me, right? So that, and it's a really hard example to like tell people about because it's so grey. But ultimately, you played with the boundary of consent. And this is a guy who to this day, like we didn't continue seeing each other because I couldn't get past it. Like I couldn't get past the fact that you did that. And you obviously knew you have a problem. So like, mitigate it or, or do something that that protects that space this is a guy who to this day follows me on instagram 
and to this day will repost my feminist shit and go, you need to be following this queen. Mm. And this is what I mean when I'm like, guys ain't shit. And even the good guys ain't shit. This is exactly what I mean. Like all the guys that you sit there and praise and go, my friend or my boys would never do that. They fucking do it, but they never tell you about it. Yeah. What, what do you think needs to happen then? Do you have a solution for it? Oh my God, make me prime minister and I will. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> this is what needs to happen. I, okay, I'll give, I'll give men the benefit of the doubt when they deserve it and when they earn it. To this day, they have yet to earn that privilege, right? Um, here's what needs to happen is, and this is why I think we have such disparity between the genders, right? Women have been talking about what it means to be a woman and girl power and feminism for a really long time, right? We, we had like the Spice Girls for girl power and we had Chimamanda and then we had, you know, Caitlin Moran. Like we've had all of these feminist icons and these like female power icons. Boys haven't. Boys haven't been talking about what it means to be a man. Like James, I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with any of your boys where you go, guys, what does your masculinity mean to you? What do you no. think manhood is? What do you think being a man in this world means? Because all we're fucking talking about is constantly is about our womanhood, how it changes in this world, how we be women who are mothers, but also CEOs, how we break glass ceilings. How, how's our womanhood in the workplace? Because we can't be like seen to be too threatening because then we're like an ice queen and we're a ball buster, right? But we want to make sure we've got senior leadership on board. So we have to make sure we play. Like all we're doing is constantly talking about womanhood. Men don't do it at all. Men don't talk about yeah. consent because they've never had to ask for it. We need the guys to have the conversations. I love this about you and, and you make such good points in terms of just, you know, I, so you have obviously had some, you know, horrible experiences at the hands of men sexually. Um, I'm quite lucky in that I've never, I can never say I've, <laughs> I've definitely been inappropriately grabbed or spoken to or treated. Um, but I'm lucky in that I can say I, I would never really go as far as to say that I felt abused um, sexually or, or in that, in that area. Um, but one thing that I found amazing about one of your um, IGTV posts was you were talking about how, and me and James have had this kind of argument before, where I've said like, you have no idea, because you're a man, and add to the fact that you're a man, you're what, six foot three, 18 stone, like you have no idea what it means when you walk home at 10 o'clock at night, which is a perfectly acceptable time, but it's dark outside, or even when it's winter at five o'clock at night and it's dark outside and there's a big wooded area and there's no one on the streets and you're a woman. And again, we come back to statistics. A lot of rape happens uh, in the vicinity of someone's house, let alone inside, which also happens as well. How scary it is and how that adrenaline is pumping through your body for 10, 20, 30 minutes until you reach your front door. How you get your key out and you hold it between your fingers because that's the only weapon you've got against a man who's twice your size. And, and the fact that you're constantly, as you just said, although this is obviously in a different context, thinking about the fact that you're a woman in some way, shape or form and men don't have to experience that. And I have a couple of transgender friends and I've said to them in the past, what makes it life so difficult being transgender? And they're, well, they're like, well, first and foremost, the fact that you are constantly thinking about your gender all the time. And I have to say that unless you are a transgender person or, or a gay man, I don't actually think that men do think about their gender or sit down with each other and talk about their gender and let alone from the perspective of women. No, never, because they've never had and to. No, I mean I don't. Would you? Is that something yeah, that you would uh, look, ever do? Uh, no. Would you be afraid that it would look make you look quote unquote? No, quote, no quote. I'm not afraid. Like I would, you know, on on couples quarantine, I'm always very honest. I'm very honest about mental health. I'm honest about the mistakes I made and how I how I work. And to be honest with you, I because of the the upbringing I had and because of my perspective on women. And like I said, I'd actually, do you know, what, latterly to to Chloe's consternation, but also sort of tongue in cheek wise, is that I we've got a group of fantastic female friends now in terms of, and I actually enjoy conversing with them, you know, more often than I do talking to lads because I've had I've had thirty five years of lad chat, lads. you know, like I, I've had that kind of that thing. It's actually quite nice to have a different perspective and 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 be able to talk in a different way and understanding different. And Chloe's taught me to be a lot more compassionate and understanding. And I'd never experienced sexism because, you know, I, I obviously had have sexist views. I am with Chloe, you know, a bit misogynist sometimes. But, but the only time I ever saw it first and foremost was when 
I would w go around with Chloe after a game, a rugby game or an event, and someone would come over to me and talk to me, not even bother acknowledging Chloe. Oh, no. Not even pretend, not, didn't even say hello to her. And then Chloe would, you know, I would then stop and go, this is my wife. This is my wife, Chloe, right? And, and someone would talk, they go, yes, not even look at her. Or they would look at her just to check if she was fit or not, mm. just to look at me and go, how's Hass doing? Is Hass doing all right? Oh, he's doing bits, that's fine. But then, but then the worst bit was is that the bloke would talk and Chloe's got a voice and opinion. She would say something and it's like, she's like, she fucking never said it. Yeah. And I would, and I went, no, no, she just said that. She, the woman standing right here just answered your question. So that for me, I found very, uh, very frustrating. It didn't sit well with me. I, it didn't, I didn't like that. I was like, you know, my wife is, 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 you know, equal and better than me in, in a hun in hundred different ways. Why would you not acknowledge me? So I can't imagine what it's like. And I, I think men need to have those conversations, but also perhaps just a, an understanding of, of what women have gone through without, you know, we all learned about the suffragettes and Emily Pankhurst, all that kind of stuff, but actually the current stuff that you face. Because again, Chloe talks about walking home. You know, I've never thought about that, that, that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah, but do you know what's interesting? I think men do know that. Like, I think men know about the suffragettes. They know about the vote for women. They know that rape is bad. Like, they know the big <laughs> stuff. And because they know those stuff, they then go, well, I would never stop a woman voting and I would never rape a woman. So therefore, I'm one of the good guys and I don't need to do yeah. anything, right? But actually, they're the men that need to have conversations. They're the people we need to have the conversations with and not the conversations about the big stuff. Like, I'm not really interested in going around telling men how bad rape is because they already know. That's just, mm. that's a useless argument. What I want to say to them is, hey, you refusing to go to therapy for all of these years means that your wife is doing most of the emotional labor and then she's carrying you through it, which means it's a toil on her. And then in that way, you're putting an extra weight on her. And oh, by the way, the fact that your wife does most of the planning for the children, like sure, you might occasionally tuck your kid into bed. But the fact that if your wife said to you, hey, um, I don't know, Daisy, on what day do, does Daisy go to dance class? You wouldn't have a fucking clue because women statistically do most of the planning and the organizing and the admin of a life and a family and the holidays and all of that stuff. And that puts a weight on her as well, right? The fact that she has to go um, at, in meetings, be the one that makes the cup of tea at work, that puts a weight on her. The fact that you're in a meeting and there's only two women and no men around that table have said, why isn't there more female representation in this meeting? Or the fact yeah. that the guy has turned around to the one woman in the meeting and said, hey, can you take notes, right? Like, and all those guys, if you turned around to them and go, why the fuck do I need to take notes just because I'm the only woman in the room? They'd be like, no, 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 no. I don't mean it like that. I'm not sexist. Like, I'm never sexist. I believe that my wife should have the vote. You know, like- you <laughs> You do an impression of me because that's, that's sort of like my it sounds like my, me and my relatives at a, in like a meeting. No, 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 no. You're good. You're done well. You're in here. Sorry, know. I was just doing a generic white Tory vote. That, that's basically what my whole setup is. That yeah. I had a I had a conversation, not a conversation because I I didn't say anything. I had a moment where I very nearly lost my shit once with one in one of James's like big family lunch dinners things, and one of the men I said something reassuring because they were saying that something something James had done or, or something they had done with James hadn't gone very well and I said something reassuring and the, the man turned to me and he went yes 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 it's very good sweetie anyway and oh. carried on oh. and I sat there and I was like I was like oh my god this is taking all my energy but it was we were new we'd only been dating a few months yeah. so I just I took myself out of the situation you can't and I, flip the table then can you you've got to wait I was like, further down the line stay, yeah I was like stay calm stay calm but I feel incredible incredibly lucky because just out of sheer personality type my mother was always uh the parent who was more kind of I don't know she she was less involved with me growing up mm. than my father was right and that was through a a, a a load of factors from you know her own upbringing to um you know d real life things that she was going through at the time um and also just her character mm. whereas my father is very caring He's a journalist, so he loves asking questions. He tries to understand. He tries to see everything from everybody's perspective. And he uh, he was the first person, really, that, that taught me about kind of uh, systemic sexism. Mm. When I, I had a fight with my first boyfriend, or several fights with my first boyfriend, who I was with for five years. And, and after a year or two of like keeping this from my dad, I finally blew up. And I was like, why does he never say sorry? 
And he was like, oh, Chloe, he was like, listen, I'm just going to tell you now. He was like, you're never, ever, ever going to find a man who will apologize to you after a fight. And I was like, why? And he was like, because you're a woman and he's a man and he will not at any point concede kind of any shame or any guilt or any wrongdoing for you. He will only ever do that for his male friends or his father or da da da. And my dad really, yeah, or his mom. Yeah, don't get me started on that. (laughs) We can get to that. Um, And it was really interesting. But this is exactly the thing, right? It's like all those little little bits, right? Like a, a guy not saying sorry or the fact that Chloe, you have to be like, we've just started dating, this is his family. I can't turn around to this guy and be like, hey, why are you being a misogynistic prick? Because then that'll make me look bad and I really like this guy. Like you're constantly doing that math every yeah. single fucking day like okay can i yeah. walk home safely is there enough places wait he said that but he's my boss and i need that promotion wait he's my boyfriend's uncle or whatever and i really like this guy and the good guys are hard to come by maybe i shouldn't say anything you are constantly doing that mental arithmetic in your head Do you know how yeah. fucking Fuck me. exhausting no wonder is. you're all completely insane this, women you've this got this much stuff going you know around I mean? your head this all is exactly time. and i wrote a whole poem about this and about like people calling me crazy and i'm like yes. And they're like they're always telling women that they're crazy. And then I, I sat down and I went, yeah, I am. I am. Fu- I have been pulled in a million different fucking ways every day. And I have to be beautiful in a very specific way, but I can't be too beautiful because then I'm just like above myself. But and I need to be, make sure that I'm a fucking sexual goddess in bed. But Lord, f- like, help me if I'm ever a hoe. And like, you're doing this balancing act constantly and you're just frazzled. By the end of it, I'm like, I am losing my fucking mind and if i go like go out and like shoot up a load of guys it's because i've lost my mind it's got me <laughs> so here so but what... this is this is one thing you said that i really really love it's so true is that every time you have as a woman you have the opportunity to speak up and stick up for yourself and usually most of the time it will either happen in a work environment where you're trying to get ahead or in a personal environment where you're not trying to be the combative one mm. so as a woman every time you have a chance to speak up and be like actually that was really fucking rude or yeah you are, you're the one who's wrong yeah. in the scenario, in the situation, because you made everybody else feel awkward. Yeah. But when you think about like the fact that we actually have to deal with that pretty much every day, we're fucked. Yeah, and we like we can't be too, like like you said, combative. We have to make sure that, you know, we're not making it awkward. And we're the ones that are always making a problem, right? So we're, mm-hmm. this is why I get so like grateful unnecessarily when there's a guy that goes hey wait a second you shouldn't have said that and I'm like oh thank god someone else said it and it wasn't me someone else can-. and when a guy says it everyone goes hmm, let's take this learning moment when I say okay. it everyone's like oh she's always fucking bringing the mood down I need more people I- like I- James I need more of you you lot to be like hey I'm gonna call this out yeah, I, I look. I, I, I 100% agree with you. And actually, one thing I do say to, to 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 my mates and people is when they talk about a girl being crazy, right? Crazy. I said somebody somewhere's made her crazy. Yeah. Somebody somewhere has gone round, banged her, not called her, not been honest, not treated her right, not argued, not apologised. Like I, I've said, I, I always do say this mm-hmm. that that you know you can't expect. Uh, you know, you, people, men create their own demons by by be, acting in a certain way without 100. education. So that, if I kill your car, for... it's not because I'm yeah. crazy. It's because you were a cunt for the last four months. That's <laughs> why. Like, maybe look at your own behaviour, bro. How did we get yeah. here? Ask yourself that. But no one does. <laughs> yeah, right? but do you think, though, and this is one thing I will say to you, James, if I know your group of friends, I know our group yeah. of friends, if you were to stand there, let's just say we, I don't know, Jason, right, yeah. one of our friends, but to say something rude or misogynistic to one of the women in our friendship group, yeah, and you were the guy who turned around and was like, mate, that was really fucking rude. Don't speak to her like that, yeah. okay? Like that, that you're not doing any men any favors here. I'll tell you why you'd never say it. Why? Because they would turn around and they would, uh, they would pack mentality, pounce <laughs> on you. Tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you might be right. You might be right. You might be right. It, yeah, it definitely, it definitely is hard. But I, I will say, I think, just to to to, con, uh, to go against that slightly, I think if you did it in front of everybody, it's it's an issue for men. What we do as men, and we do in this group, have conversations on the side and go, listen, 
just between you and me, mate. You can't, you can't. Yeah, do but that. that's you've bullshit. Because why should I protect your fucking ego? Because you were happy enough to give a misogynistic comment in front of everyone and degrade me in front of everyone. But what? I've got to have a private conversation with you to make sure that this <laughs> learning point lands in the right way, and you don't feel like your ego's bruised. This is a problem. We are constantly yeah. managing male emotion, Men. and it is fucking exhausting. Like even <laughs> in a relationship, like you're constantly going, "Is this the right time to bring it up?" Because you're in that kind of mood. Maybe I should bring it up in like when you're in a better mood or like you're constantly doing that and I always wonder do guys have the same mental arithmetic no because yeah. whatever falls out of their mouth can just really go and they're like there's no reason yeah we don't right? we, we, you know th- th- I mean but again that's it that's our point of, of uh, common ground yeah is that you wouldn't say it because you know that it would be a problem for the for the men plural yeah. or singular but yeah. most likely plural in the group mm. but if you said it privately one-on-one yeah it would be a conversation that you could maturely have. So now imagine what it's like to be a woman not being able to say that to the man and or all the yeah. men in the group. Yeah. And what happens? She's gobby. Yeah. Don't like her. She's but gobby. You know Don't like her, mate. Right. But like, James, you said to me, well, what's the solution? But I ask you the same question, right? As a guy, and also, like you said, as a very like alpha male, like white, Middle class guy, right? Like, yeah, you, you missed out a bit of privilege. You almost put bangs privileged on the end. Of well, it. I thought, like, you know, all of that says enough, doesn't it? Um, oh, fine, yeah. Right. So, like, what is the solution? Because you're surrounded by these guys every day, and arguably the men who are in power, who hold positions of like management or seniority that don't give women chances. What is the solution? No, I, I mean, I I think it's got to happen early on in, in education stage, and, and actually at school in terms of the, the interaction and just some of the way that. Uh, because again, it, lots so, lots of relationships, you know, it, it, even at home, you know, your first interaction of seeing a relationship is, you know, say you've got a dominant father and a, and a submissive mother, you know, you <laughs> re- <laughs> you rarely have these these different things. I think it's very hard. So at school, you know, where they, where you basically have the the kids' attention for a period of time, if they're not going to get it at home. You need to teach them those lessons there. I also think. You know where there was a big outcry when basically, in, especially in BBC and all the TV programmes, where they fired a lot of men and put women in place, right? And, and you know, a lot of people came out and were like, well, hold on a minute, you know, is this right? And, and I remember Chloe saying something to me that really stuck with me. Because I'm always very much like, the best person for the job is important. I don't, I, I, but, but what she pointed out was, she goes, these women might not be the best people at this moment in time to do it, but because it's been so unbalanced for such a long time that there is no aspiration for women coming through to look and see people in places like that. And actually she converted me. And I was like, do you know what? Because it is so unbalanced in the corporate world and in other places that that you should go, go out of your way to, to employ, say, women in these positions because it might not be the right thing now, but in 10 years' time, you're going to have a, a, a succession period of the mm. top people in these things, you know, and, and give people a better opportunity. So I think better conversations at school uh, around this kind of stuff and explaining stuff. You know, we learn a load of shit at school that we never use. getting rid of, like, boys-only boarding schools, yeah. girls-only boarding schools. We live in, you know, a, a world where there is, you know, there are two sexes and, of course, everything in between that. You need to be educated with your counterpart. I agree. I agree. Like that's why. I mean, again, I, I, I was handicapped to start with. There is no way that I was ever going to come into this world uh, thinking anything other than what I did. Right. And it's sort of like I'm being deprogrammed again. Like I always find it hard that women can either be super good at their job or have a family, or they, or you know, you can be really powerful, but you can't be, you know, you can't be maternal. maternal. You know, if a woman with the morals of a man is a slut, I've talked about it before. You know, women fuck a load of women. Like, oh, what a whore! And I, I've had this conversation with men where I go, I say to someone, they're like, oh, I think she slept around a bit. I was like, but so are fucking you. <laughs> And I, I say this, I say, and they're like, yeah, but it's not the same. I said, no, it is the and same. Wants exactly. It's without, exactly the same. You wouldn't hire someone for a job without any experience anyway. That's what. That's why when people, you know, when they talk about, you know, going to paradise with 77 virgins, I'm like, fuck that. 77 virgins. Like, do you know the admin around like, all of that? like, one milf and I'm sweet. Yeah, I, one old cougar would just do me no no, no, no problem. Um, but I just, I, I mean, I, I think those conversations just need to be had. You are, you are right. And I'm not, you know, I'm not just saying it because you're on here. I do... You, I, on a day-to-day basis, it does not come into my mind. It does not affect me. Yeah. I've got a strong-willed wife. I basically treat, you know, I push her as hard as she can be to be the most successful version of herself. She supports me. I come to her for all her opinions. Yes, we have our ups and downs. Yes, we fight like cats and dogs. And we are 
you know, men are from Venus or women from Mars, whatever it is, we are those things. And we're, we're going through a process of kind of learning and understanding masculine energy, female energy, where, where she's coming from, where I'm coming from. Women are from Venus. Women from Venus, wherever you're <laughs> fucking from, wherever it's from, um, you know, is, is, is something that I've got, I've got to learn. But I think there's definitely more we can do. But it, this is the thing, like, you're like, education matters. And you're right, like, there needs to be so much more education on the ground. But then what about all the generations of men that, that we have to deal with today? Because I, I can't just be like, hey, the, the, the kids coming up are going to be great. I just cannot. I need the guys now to be great because they're the motherfuckers I have to interact with on a daily basis. And quite frankly, mm. they are trolling my life. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> they're the ones in it. So how do we get guys great now? Because, look, I get it. You're a product of your environment and everyone is. And we are all formed by the habits of our societies and our culture. That's mm. a given. So, James, you growing up in a boarding school and you coming through and then being in, like, competitive sports environments, like, you're in, like, the most laddish place ever where mm. all of that lad behaviour and misogyny just fucking blooms, right? Like, it's the perfect mm. environment for it to grow. It's like right? a Petri dish for, Honestly, for, for misogyny. It is. Yeah. Like, all these, yeah. all these young, horny boys in a boarding school together beating off over the one, like, girl that walked past and then, like, in <laughs> locker rooms. Like, locker room talk is a thing for a reason, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, so then my question is, okay, well, you're in that position. You've come through that environment. You know it better than anyone else. You're in a position of privilege. You're surrounded by strong-willed women. How do you educate your boys? And how do you educate the men around you? Not the kids coming up. How do you educate the men around you? Because it ain't my responsibility to fix sexism in the way that it's not the responsibility of black people to fix racism, right? I need <laughs> men to fix sexism, right? Because right. there's no point in me preaching to a room full of women because they know. They've been knowing it for some time now, right? I'm not trying to convince the women. I'm trying to convince the men where they go, we need to talk about consent in sport. We need to talk about male elite sport sports stars and power and privilege and how that works in sexual instances. We need to talk about misogyny and how we all actively, the 10 of us in this locker room can do one good action each to make sure that we have more women in this sport. How the fuck yeah. do we do that? Because it ain't my job to fix it and you're in the perfect position. So I really only came here on this podcast to tell you that you got to do something. Yeah, I fucking, all right, so basically, basically I'm now the, the, the I'm male suffragette for this yeah. whole thing. I mean, what, I mean, look. It's, it's true, Sorry. you know, we, so I recently recorded an episode of James's podcast, What a Flanker, and I would say the first half hour, sorry, rugby fans, the first half hour of the podcast is talking about male athletes, uh, their entitlement, their privilege and how they uh, uh, perceive women. Um, and I think it is a hundred percent. If you take, you know, the most masculine men that you can think of them, they're, they're more often than not going to be athletes, right? Competitive athletes, um, usually part of a team, although not necessarily. If you get a group of you lot together and you start speaking in a man's tone, because look, nobody's pretending men and women are the same in terms of our characteristics and our instincts. We're right. not, we're absolutely not. Nobody's saying that. So you take the narrative voice of a man and you speak up for women, but in your narrative masculine voice and in whatever fucking tone you want to do, I don't care. And everybody speaks up about it. That could absolutely have a positive impact on the new generation of men coming up mm -hmm. and potentially the current. And also to all the mothers out there who maybe are, you know, kind of surrounded by boys and, and, and there are no women in your, in your family or maybe there haven't been in the past. Raise your son, the plural, to see a really strong woman in you. Am I and not to see a woman who sits down and shuts up at the hands of all the men around her. Right. That, that, I would say that. As well. Am I hearing sort of potentially some sort of show or campaign or charity we're about to start? Yeah, I you two should. You I, two I, feel, I feel like, because the thing is, I don't, I, I'm always reticent to, to go over the top because, you know, I haven't, when I was single, I didn't, you know, and I, this is why I always try to qualify some of this. I wasn't, didn't always treat women nicely. You know, I'd go around, bang them, never call them again, do whatever. Like I didn't, you know, and I, I regret doing that and I wasn't always you know honest I was very honest about you know what I wanted from from the situation like I was very upfront there was no ever any gray areas but I look back and I think I probably could have done things better the worst thing you could do is pretend to be holier than thou and it's like I'm not I I, I have misogynist views I make I make mistakes I, I say things that I shouldn't and I would like to do more about it because obviously it is an issue and I think so many people are in relationships or so many people dating who aren't happy who perhaps don't understand 
that they're making life worse for themselves if they could understand and do things a bit better. And there's a lot of women out there suffering who who don't need to be. And there's a lot of kind of behaviour going under the being brushed under the carpet that doesn't. And if I could help that, I would love to do that. But no, I think you're I think Fine. you're doing you're doing a huge service right. to, to. I think if you were to start speaking up, you'd be doing a yeah. huge right. service. And like because men don't they don't speak up about the nuanced stuff. I don't want I don't want to have I don't want men to be having conversations about like rape, like I said, I, I just or domestic abuse and like lads this is why we don't hit women like it's rudimentary we don't need to be having those conversations right but like twice in this conversation james you referred to having sex with a woman as someone banging her like your mates <laughs> have banged her and yeah. then you have banged this woman yeah. right like which is a violent rhetoric as it is right women are always getting nailed banged like why is it always so fucking violent right yeah but this is the thing like how many times does just one of your friends come in and go oh i banged this last and you go yeah but did you make her come during sex <laughs> because actually yeah. if you didn't make her come she banged you oh, right and actually that's yeah. not sex because why aren't we teaching men sex isn't until you've made a woman come because and i'm talking about this in a heteronormative relationships because actually you're always going to come as a guy nine times out of ten even more you're always going to come right she's not mm -hmm. right and we're not taught to give women pleasure women aren't taught to ask for pleasure so actually why isn't the conversation like if men if a guy wants to come into the locker room and go i made her come four times last night i'll even stand up and fucking applaud him right, right. i'm like great why well, maybe should be listening to my conversations why isn't yeah, that the rhetoric yeah, right but the rhetoric no, I, is you banged her i banged her yeah but this see the one thing i've never understood about that you though, are very good with that is that is one thing i've never said is that i my soul and again i'm not talking myself out like this isn't this but i you know my mates will, will back me up on this my sole objective when i was having sex was to make them come to make them enjoy themselves right. without putting like I, i've seen a pressure on them without without being like you know like going you know because it, i know there's a lot of women there like men think about this and they go oh my god he's trying so hard it's just not going to happen it's not going to work because it's so hard to come from penetrative sex it's so hard to come from certain things mm. that men don't understand mm. And, you know, they're, they're going down and it's like they're, you know, I don't know what they're doing or they're trying to play with your family and they're rubbing it like a lamp, expecting a genie to come out of it. All this kind of stuff. Like I, That's not that bad. Well, it depends. Actually. It depends on what, 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 you know, try, get the genie out, get the genie out, the genie's coming. Um, I, I basically saw that as something to really kind of get better at. So I, I we talked to one of the early podcasts at a book called She Comes First, which was was incredible about kind of going um, all sex and going down the girl. And basically, you know, I, I read that and I, then I passed it on to a couple of teammates and they're on, genuinely their wives came up to me and were like, thank you. So right. I take that, I take that really seriously. Like I, I want to do that. Like, I, cause I had early on, I had an experience with a girl when I was um, doing the, you know, f f finger play and I basically, instantly i could see that my techers was shit house and she was like her whole demeanor changed yeah you have to teach and i didn't i didn't know and I, as soon as i got that and i was like early on i was like oh my god i've right. got to raise my game and that's what we need to have more conversations with other guys and, you, and like you knowing that and you and that being your mo like you're absolutely the exception you're not the rule because the rule is that like how many guys like there are so i've got so many stories from girlfriends as well where a guy goes i won't need to use my fingers like my dick's good enough and i'm oh, like you're an idiot off. You're an idiot. You don't even understand how the female body works. And now you're claiming to be like some god at it. But like, yeah. and it's, it's these nuanced things. Like, it's not like your, your average woman in a Western world isn't going around like riling against the huge big things. She's just like, every time I have sex, he comes and I got to like sort myself out with my vibrator once he leaves. That's a fucking yeah. daily <laughs> shit that she's that dealing with. True. Or like, I don't yeah. know when I should say something in a meeting and no other guy will say something. It's all those like everyday stuff that I'm just like, guys, it is so easy for you to get it right and you get it so wrong on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you know what's so funny? Like when, oh, you were saying, just full circle back to one of your first stories about the guy with the condom or lack thereof. Mm. How you're like, I don't want to be the one to say like, oh, can you, because you're breaking the sexual moment yeah. you're breaking the sexual momentum and and then you feel shit about yourself they might be like they might make you feel shit about yourself i would just like to say that never goes away no. never like there are, i've had experiences in long-term relationships with guys who have been like absolute who have made me feel like shit if they couldn't make me squirt for example, mm. and I know that that's a little bit, you know, that's reaching, that's a very specific, you know, professional thing. It's a very professional thing. But that's exactly just that. It's a professional thing. As in, that's what someone who's really good in bed can do. Now, I'm not saying that all women can't do it. I'm pretty sure that most women with the right guy can. But the fact that it's the woman's fault if right. she can't do right. something that the man wants. And 
even the point where you're like, if you don't want to have sex, then you have to accept by societal norms, as you also referenced, that your husband might cheat on you yeah. because you're not putting out. And it is so fair to say that there is far too much pressure on women sexually to step up to the mark. And the only way that we can equalize that a little bit is if men like you, and you are fucking brilliant at this, you really do care about the woman in the bedroom and you get 10 out of 10 for that. But you're married in it. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's not. It's, it's not for my feminine it's uh, approach, why I is kept it? Him. it? Wasn't for your brain, um, James. It was just uh, <laughs> <yes. laughs> fingers. Very true. Very You're true. You've got to make up. Yeah, but the thing is, you um, know, like, who is but you, you would make a difference. Sorry, go on. It's Eddie Murphy in one of his stand-ups for all the things he gets wrong. One of the things he says, you know, if you make a girl go, ooh, he goes, you can do whatever you want. You <laughs> yeah. can do whatever you want as long as she's coming because because if you ain't take care of business, right? If she if she thinks about leaving you, and you're such a fuck up and an idiot. But you make her go, ooh, then. <laughs> You, then you fucking. It is so that's true. It. I'm telling you, they, it, because the bar is so fucking low. If you, if a guy goes, no, I don't come before you. It's like, oh my! It's like we yeah. found the fucking holy grail. <clears throat> Honest right? to God, it's it's because it, it's so unprecedented that that ever happens and because all you guys can sit around in your in your locker room go yeah yeah I always make women come but it's bullshit and you're all fucking lying right <laughs> and there might be <laughs> one of you that's telling the truth but most of you are like just chatting shit because even yeah. like and I said this to a friend once and I said um and this, and it, this is this is what happened that we I was out for dinner with two guys right and I work with them and there was there's a work reference when we we're out for dinner but one of them had like pursued me for quite some time and I knew he had like a thing for me and he always wanted to get in there I was never interested in him so I always like just kept him up at arm's, arm's end and he was always like like and I knew and a, a woman knows I knew and I've known for some time if I click my fingers I could have that man if I wanted him right dead sir so we're around we're around the table and there's another guy there now who he's friends with as well and th- and we're talking and he's like, yeah, I've, I've, I've got a woman, but you know, like it's kind of on again, off again, but we're kind of, I'm like, does she think she's on with you? And he's like, well, yeah. And I'm like, so it's on basically. Um, and then uh, he like turns to me and says something like flirty and that like I could always have him or something. And then he turns around to, to the guy and he's like, but you know, guy, like men just know like our integrity, like we wouldn't do stuff like that. And the guys are like, yeah, yeah. And I just stared at them both. And I was like, this is how you guys trick yourselves into believing that your boys are good. Because you all sit around a table and go, I'd never like play this woman, you know, because it's our integrity. Yeah, 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 yeah. And everyone goes, yeah, 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 like wanking over each other. And meanwhile, you've just whispered in my fucking ear, you piece of shit, how I could fucking have you. And I know I could. And I'm like, and it was the clearest example to me. And I was like, ah, that's how it happens. And I said to my friend, I said, you, you, you boys, you don't even know your boys. You think you know your boys. And then you all sit around in conversations with women and go, my boys are the good guys. My boys would never do that. You don't even know your boys. You don't know what your oh, boys yeah. would do because your boys aren't even truthful with you. And 100%. then we know what your boys would do because your, your friend is out there yeah, on stage talking about patriarchy. I'll and all the women you, in the audience are like, oh my God, what a good guy. But I know the woman that was dating him and he's a piece of shit behind he's closed doors. He's a piece doors. of shit. Oh my God, pre- preach. Exactly. I'm so fucking happy you said that. There are so many men out there who sit on Instagram talking about women, right? even talking about mental health, suicide. Yeah. Behind closed doors, you want to know what they're really like? Because they're the worst of fucking all of you them. You know what I mean? Virtue signalers, it, the exactly. worst. Exactly. And I'm like, if you ever want to know how feminist a man is, get him in your bed sheets and then you'll fucking know his, his attitude to women. Or talk to the woman who was fucking him and then you'll know exactly how much oh, yeah. his like, oh, you're such a queen comment fucking lies. <laughs> I'd also say, talk, talk to the ex-girlfriend or, I'm sorry, yeah. my ex-girlfriend was fucking crazy. Red flag, red Absolutely. flag Absolutely, right if any guy said that to me, I'd be like, actually, you probably drove her mental. I'm never talking to you. Thank you. We'll set up. Well, listen. If people, if people have had experiences like this and and, and like what Sir Sam was saying, and, and think you could maybe do more, please send your questions to CQ Questions at jameshaskell.org. That's CQ Questions at jameshaskell.org. Sam, there's so much more I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah, so, so we, much more. We want. I wanted to talk about you know obviously because this is probably made ten times worse and more difficult being a Muslim woman yeah. and the the views that. But we didn't even get into that. No, we need like four uh, different porn. podcasts. Yeah, doing? I wanted to talk to you about porn. I've got so many notes here. Sexual experiences as a young girl versus an adult. I mean, honestly, Let's... we'll have you back and we'll do it all properly again. We'll have to get a series too. But if people want to follow you, where can they Where can they find you? Um, they can mainly find me on the gram. It's just my name, Salma El Wadani, which you probably won't be able to spell, but just search James's followers and you'll find me in there. <laughs> um, you also, you're, is your book out yet? 
No, uh, fingers crossed, I will keep you updated on it, but we're talking to publishers. <laughs> Exciting. Okay. But you will. Everyone will know about it because everyone I've ever spoken to, even if that includes the postman, will be obligated to buy three copies. So yes, <laughs> I'll be that yeah, fine. I, will, I will do that. Um, I'm on it, babe. I'm on it. Well, listen, I, I, Sam, you've been brilliant. I'm James Haskell. You oh, are. Now I get it. The outro. I'm Chloe. <laughs> um, What's let, up? This is a Couples <laughs> Quarantine. If you like it, please share. Please subscribe. Give everyone a follow. Let us know what you thought of it in the comments. As I said, email us cqquestions at jameshaskell.org. We'll be back very soon. Thanks for having me, guys.